Last Saturday, I was invited to uh, the Chogya International Zen Center, uh, which is an offshoot of Korean Zen here in the U.S. It's on East 14th Street, uh, right next to Immaculate Conception Church, which you know, will turn out to be interesting when, as you see as I do the Taisho. Um, uh, I was invited there to, to do an interface discussion uh, after the morning practice, an offshoot of my invitation to Providence, uh, Rhode Island, which is the center of the Korean Zen, uh, Providence Zen Center last, uh, last fall. They've been there in, in, uh, in the East, East uh, Village for uh, more than 20 years in the two joined departments, very similar to the arrangement that Roshi Kennedy has in, in Jersey City uh, for his Zendo. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, uh, they gave me, uh, there's Zen Master Sung San, who uh, very much around the same time that you had this great fervor in San Francisco and, and, and LA too, our, our own Mayazumi Roshi. Uh, he was the Korean master who came over and, and started this in the early 70s. And, um, so his, one of his books is, uh, The Whole World is a Single Flower. Um, of course, that's reminiscent of the koan at the beginning of the Mamon Khan, when the Buddha himself is passing on, his transmitting his lineage to, it turns out, Kasyapa, and all he does is hold up a flower. And since Kasyapa smiled and, and got it, uh, he was the one who received the transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you say anything, you're, you're doomed. So he just uh, held up a flower. The whole world is a single flower. Or you can say a single flower is the whole world. Everything is connected. Mm -hmm. But this particular book, uh, originally published in the early 90s, is uh, 365 kongans or koans for everyday life. So in other words, a page a day kind of thing uh, on its own. Um, but uh, what really struck me, and I, I was not aware of this, uh, is, and there are, there are f four forewords here, you know, to show that it, it, Master Seung San was very open and ecumenical to begin with. Um, so that, that also explains why my Father Kevin Hunt, who's a Cistercian successor of Roshi Kennedy, has been in close contact for a long time with the Providence Zen Center. Well, you'll see. Here, um, well, first of all, you know that uh, uh, Thomas Merton uh, knew D.T. Suzuki, one of the Zen pioneers in America, who was very impressed with Master Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, you know, the 14th century Dominican mystic who got himself into a lot of trouble, as all mystics do, especially in the Middle Ages, um, and saw a similarity between that and Zen. Well, here, what happened was, uh, they, uh, the, the Cistercians at Gethsemane, where Thomas Merton lived, and although this was after his death, uh, invited uh, Song San to come uh, regularly to them. And he found that, that they were meditating on the, uh, some of the sayings, some of the many, more than a thousand, more than 1,500 short poems of uh, Angelus Silesius. Now, his, uh, his actual name is Johannes Scheffler, uh, 17th century uh, mystic who was Lutheran, but then read the medieval mystics and converted to Catholicism and became a Franciscan and actually spent some time then living in a Jesuit house apparently towards the end of his life. So if you get mixed up with Franciscans and, and Jesuits, you know, you're, you're finished. So, uh, of course, we're here in a Franciscan you know, establishment ourselves. Uh, but uh, the Silesius poems were shown to him, shown to the Zen, Zen master, and he said, oh, wow, this is, this is just like this, like this D.T. Suzuki said about Meister Eckhart. This is very much uh, like, this is Zen. So he turned a number of the short poems, four-line short poems of Angelus Silesius into koans. Hmm? And so we're going to look at some of those. The introduction, though, is we have the four introductions. One is by uh, uh, Stephen Mitchell, who's a translator of, uh, of, the, of Taoism. And there, you know, he points out, you know, 
the importance of Taoism for Zen, and I wouldn't be the first one to say that without Taoism, Buddhism would not have become Zen. That's just simple as that. We would not have Zen without Taoism merging with Buddhism. Uh, but he has an uh, interesting reflection. He says, when the Buddha held up a flower, and when Jesus took a child in his arms, they were saying the same thing. Well, I think so. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That kind of immediacy of the presence of God. Uh, the editor's preface uh, explains uh, the, uh, the uh, Angelus Silesius, uh, Angelus, you know, an angel from Silesia, which is now part of Poland. Um, uh, one of his great works is called, the, he says, The Wandering Cherub. cherub. Actually, it's Cherubinisha Vandesman, which means the cherubic wanderer. That was one of his works. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so she, she explains that, the, uh, the editor. Then there's an essay by, by one of the monks of Gethsemane. And he points out, what Merton also pointed out, that some of the sayings of the Desert Fathers, these uh, are very much like koans. They're, they're different in many ways, but the pithiness of them, the directness of them, the concreteness of them, much like the parables of Jesus, is, that is very similar to Zen. Merton had pointed that out himself um, when he became interested in Zen. But one thing the, the brother says here is that uh, the Korean teaching is not new teaching, and most likely the desert monk's flower was no new flower. And it's true, it's just what's true from the beginning of the world, all of these things, just approaching it from different angles. And it's all one flower, so to speak, hmm? which is a good insight. And finally, uh, the introduction by the mass gen master himself uh, points out, as always, he's pointing out the immediacy of the experience, uh, you're doing what you're doing, this is Zen, just do it. And if you completely do it, he says, then your everyday mind is correct life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's the same point. Oh, interesting. So in other words, if you're completely doing something, you're truly alive, and you're on the way. This is the truth right here and now. It's really what Jesus meant. I would say he's right. Hmm? if you really penetrate to the depth of what, uh, what that always means. Will you attain the way, the truth, and the life, he says, which means from moment to moment, being in the correct situation, correct relationship, correct function. That's really what means, Jesus means by being in, being in Christ, you know, being the Buddha. It's great love, great compassion, and the great bodhisattva way. So let's look at, uh, there are more than 15 of them here in the, in the collection. We're going to look at them quickly. Uh, some of them, uh, most of them, and you'll see what we're dealing with here. What, uh, it's, it's quite fascinating. So, number 62, the burning fire. So this is the translation of the little couplet by Silesius. You are the burning fire, I the reflected glow. How could I without you and you without me grow? Of course, you, the burning fire, in this context is God. You know, in the Christian context, I'm the glow. So we're, we're made in the image of God. We're just the reflection, the glow of God. Um, but I could not grow without that. And God could not grow in the sense of manifest without me. Commentary by the master. Mind appears and you and I are separate. Mind disappears, and you and I are never separate. Hmm? So as soon as the dis discriminating, discerning mind comes, then you have the separations, you know, emptiness form and all the different. But if mind disappears, that is the, the dis discriminating mind, if it's just Buddha mind, if it's just Christ consciousness, well then they're all, no separation. Emptiness form, absolute relative. Hmm? All as nothingness. We talked about nothingness recently, didn't we? Here's the poem. Who sees the all as nothingness, as nothing all that is, sees everything through God's own eye. Enlightenment is this. Indeed. So 
all is, everything is a nothingness, emptiness. And nothingness, emptiness is all that is. Hmm? That's seeing from the divine perspective, hmm? what we would say. Hmm? So again, the, uh, the reflection by the master. Open your mouth and everything appears. That's the relative appearing. But close your mouth and nothing appears. And that's all is nothing, nothing is all. Hmm? But be careful, he says. Don't be attached to emptiness and stillness. It's very important and it comes up a lot in Zen. You know, once you, it's, it's what the, the Sandokai says, uh, he who has experienced the absolute is not yet enlightened. It's how everything is together, absolute and relative, emptiness, form and form is emptiness. Hmm? So if you're just being attached to emptiness, then you're still a long way off. Hmm? And that happens to a lot of people in, in all the traditions, by the way. Mm -hmm. Next one, pure emptiness. <laughs> Here we go again. Here's the poem. The God who is pure emptiness is created as form, becoming substance, light, and darkness, the stillness, and the storm. That's like all the koans, you know, where the absolute manifests as mountains and rivers and streams because that's just the way it is, the emptiness, relative and, and the absolute uh, together. And the commentary, cuts! And that's the s stick hitting. Is that God or is it substance? Which is it? Is it the absolute or the relative, in other words? If you say substance, you go to hell. If you say God, you're already dead. So if you say either one, you're saying, you're separating, and of course you missed it. It has to be the experience. Hmm? The next one. The deepest well. You are the deepest well from which all rises and grows. You are the boundless ocean back into which all flows. It's like the image of the ocean and the wave and, and the Zen, you know, the absolute and the relative. But who's the you there? You are the deepest well from which all rises grows. You are the boundless ocean back into which all flows. Well, it would seem to be God, but where's the separation from you? Hmm? Now that's the commentary. How wide is your mind? How deep? If you understand this, you meet God face to face, the master says. So you're seeing all with God's eyes. Hmm? Next one, God inside God. I was God inside God before this time-bound me and shall be God again when from my me set free. Just a divine idea, are you? Inseparable from God, inseparable from God. It's not pantheism, it's just that there's no separation. So the commentary, God made everything, so everything has God nature. Interesting way of putting it. If mind appears, you lose God nature. But if you take away mind, you are always sitting with God. Another way of saying it. Hmm. The next one, empty becoming. The emptier I do become, the more delivered from the me, the better shall I understand what is God's liberty. So when you're separated from your ego, you know what divine freedom is. 69, Jesus Christ. However well of Jesus Christ you talk and sermons preach, uh-oh, I better watch out. However well, however well of Jesus Christ you talk and sermons preach, unless he lives within yourself, he is beyond your reach. Okay, obviously. It's an interior reality. It's you. Mm -hmm. But the commentary is interesting. The master says, the cross sets you free. If you attain the cross, you sit together with God. Wow, I mean, the poem doesn't even talk of the cross, and here's the Zen master talking of the cross. What does he mean? Well, maybe... Uh, the fact that 
well, you have to get beyond your ego so that really, you really do live in Christ and Christ in you. That's the cross, you know, dying to your little self. Or maybe it's the balance and the connection of everything. It could mean that too. But it's fascinating that he mentions it, uh, that he speaks that way. Uh, this is more like St. Paul here. Without a single law. The precepts are only for the wicked. St. Paul says the same thing. The law is for the unjust, not for the just. The precepts are only for the wicked. Without a single law, the just will love all living things, holding God's life in awe. Yes, it's just spontaneous compassion and love for everything, and of everything, and in you, through you. Just a couple more. Inside, outside. And of course, as you know, there's no inside, outside once you really get it. But if you go out, God will come in. So die. In God, withdraw. Not being, you will be in God. Not doing, you will live God's law. And that reminds me very much of Wu Wei in Taoism. Not doing is the best way of doing. In other words, it's not a conscious, you know, calculated kind of doing. It's just the spontaneity of life itself. Not doing is really, it's not you doing it. In other words, you, your limited self doing it. It's just, it's just doing, pure, pure walking as we do in Zen, just pure sitting, pure, pure breathing. It's not you doing it. Uh, so there's no inside, outside, no absolute and relative. The commentary, coming or going, God is never separate from you. If you laugh, God is happy. And if you cry, God is sad. No separation. It's a consolation too because God is laughing and weeping with you. Mm -hmm. This is a good one. Christ's birth and death. Christ was born human for me and for me he died. If I don't get transformed in God, his birth is mocked his death denied. So what good does it do for Christ to be born and die if we don't do it with him and get transformed into him? That's the whole point of it. The commentary is good. The blue sky is Christ's face. The blue mountain is his body. The risen, risen cosmic Christ, everything is Christ, just like everything is the Buddha. And just a few more. The nature of all things. If to the nature of all things you wish to penetrate, you will know all if you can find the door to just one thing. Very Zen. What's Zen? Well, six pounds of flax or a shirt or the yoke tree in the garden. One thing. If you can get one thing, you get everything. If you want to know the nature of all things, just know the nature of one thing. A grain of sand, a stone, and it, it's all connected. Hmm? No fear of death. The wise have no fear of death. Too often have they died to ego and its vanities, to all that keeps them tied. John of the Cross has the image of the, the bird taking flight or not because it's tied by just a little tiny thread. And he says, what, even if the tiniest thread, the tiniest attachment, it can still keep you from flying. You gotta die to all that. Mm -hmm. And if you die before you die, you won't die when you die, you know that old saying. So you have no fear of death since you've been dying every day. But the, comment <laughs> the commentary is funny. Listen to this. You must pay for the rental car when you return it. <laughs> In other words, give an account of the body when you <laughs> give it back. <laughs> How are you living and dying? Mm -hmm. This is very Zen. Always in paradise. No thought for the hereafter is cherished by the wise. For on this earth they truly live always in paradise. You know, that's like Hakuin saying, you know, the Zen master saying that, uh, that uh, this land is the pure land, right? This moment is the, is the pure land and this body is, is, is the Buddha body. It's right here and now already. You know, heaven is already within you as Richard War would say, uh, as anyone would say who has experienced it. Mm -hmm. uh, the commentary says, when desire appears, hell and paradise appear. But when desire disappears, hell and paradise disappear. 
So you can see how hell disappears when the desire disappears, but even the paradise as a separate kind of thought, or it's just things as they are, if, they're really, if you're really awakened. This is an easy one. The deepest prayer. The deepest prayer on this earth that anyone could say is that which makes me wholly one with that to which I pray. So that's the awareness that you know, prayer is not something you, you don't pray to something out there. You're wholly one with, you are the prayer, you are the connection with yourself. The commentary is quite beautiful and subtle. The mother rubs her child's stomach. There's no separation huh? between God and us. And it's consoling. And then he adds, <clears throat> to my shame, the priest prays in church. But otherwise you're always one with. You don't have to go anywhere for that. And just two more. At the soul's center. Unless you find the paradise at your soul's very center, you haven't got the smallest chance that you can once there enter. No. Once again, it's inside you. And finally, this is fairly easy too. Christians are foolish thinking they can attain redemption while their bodies and their souls remain attached to worldly goals. Yeah. But the commentary is good. Don't make anything, don't want anything, then the universe will give you everything. It's really what Jesus says when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and its justice and everything else will be given to you besides. Or what St. Paul says, we have nothing and yet we possess all things. No clinging and everything is yours. So, um, that's a, a fascinating, uh, I wasn't aware of this connection, you know, with uh, the, the Korean Zen and the Cistercians and the, and, and the, the, the Christian koans and the Silesia so, but, it, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful. When I visited, visited there with, uh, 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 up in Providence the last fall, Kevin Hunt had actually made a koan out of Martha and Mary from the gospel. So he took something right from the gospel and turned it into a koan for the community, which is interesting. You know. So you can work with the different traditions in all these ways and find, find a pithy koan to get you going. And of course, as you know, and as has often been said, the main koan for you is you. <laughs> <laughs>